Hi everyone and welcome to lecture five. In this lecture we're going to talk about factorial designs. The best way of course to learn about any of these types of designs is to start with an example. So that's what we'll do today. So let's consider a study that measures performance on some task as a function of the motivation level, so either low, medium, or high, and task difficulty, easy or hard. So this is a, already you can see a more complex design than some of the things that we've talked about so far. And let's see some data. So here are the data that I want to present to you. I've got five observations on each possible combination of motivation level and task difficulty. So what you can see now is I have six cells here. Each of those cells has five data points or five observations, independent observations within them. Uh, that gives me a total of n equals 30 for this study. And I want to know what's going on. I want to know what these data are saying. Now, of course, uh, it's really hard to just look at the numbers and see what's going on. I, I really can't tell anything about how performance uh, differs as a function of motivation level or task difficulty, uh, at least at first. So, of course, let's plot. Now, there are lots of different ways to plot, but the way that I'm going to propose doing this today is we're going to take each one of these cells, each one of these groups of five observations, and we're going to collapse them. We're going to collapse them by taking their mean. So, for example, for the five people who had low motivation level and an easy task, we're going to compute that mean. So we'll take 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 6 plus 4. We'll add those together to get uh, 15, divide by 5, that gives a mean of 3 for this condition. And then we can do similar for each of the other 5 conditions, and then we can plot those on a graph, something like this. Now you can see there are 6 uh, little points here. These 6 points are the means of these 6 cells. Um, and the way I've got this structured is I put motivation level on the uh, horizontal axis. The reason is because I can naturally order motivation from low to medium to high in a way that makes sense. And then to represent the variability of difficulty, I plotted those in different symbols and connected them with lines. So immediately you can start to see some things here. So that, of course, then leads me to ask a question that I would as a researcher, and that is, what is the story here? What's going on with these data? Um, does motivation level matter? Okay, so you can look at these data and see that performance seems to generally increase, right, as motivation level goes up. If I go from low to medium to high, I generally am getting bigger numbers as I go. Although clearly there's something, something going on here. So we'll get to that. The other question that I might ask is, does difficulty matter? Now, I can see that pretty easily. I can see that when the task is easy, right, the, the symbols are the X's, I get higher uh, performance than I do when the task is hard. There, there's vertical separation between these two groups of data points. So difficulty seems to matter. Is there anything else going on? Well, of course there is. There's something that we haven't, haven't captured with those two questions, and that is notice how for easy tasks, motivation seems to increase this way, or, or as motivation increases, performance also increases, but that pattern doesn't necessarily hold for hard tasks. So there's some way that these two variables, this motivation level variable and this difficulty level variable are, are interacting with each other. Okay, so it's just a whole mess of questions with a whole mess of data. How do I make sense of this? How will I ever hope to systematically investigate such questions? And the answer is we use the classic factorial design. The factorial design is something that gives us a structured way to answer these questions that I'm interested in. And the way it does is, is it uses the language of main effects and interactions. So I want to spend the first part of the lecture just talking about what we mean by a main effect and what we mean by an interaction. And the best way to do this is to just look at the table of means and do some computations with them. So to see what these are, let's consider this table of means. Uh, these are just the numbers uh, that correspond to the mean performance in each of those six cells. Uh, so instead of seeing the raw data here, you're just seeing the mean. And now what I want to do is something that I've done for every one of our ANOVA type designs before, and that is I want to compute the marginal means. So let's do that here. Let's do the marginal mean for uh, motivation level. So what we're going to do is we're going to go across the row and just say, what's the mean of those two means? 
The mean of 3 and 1, of course, is 2. The mean of 3 and 5 is 4, etc. In fact, let's just do that at once. Those marginal means are 2, 4, and 6. Now, what you can see now is you can see a pattern that's emerging for performance as a function of motivation level. As motivation level goes from low to medium to high, it seems like the marginal mean performance also increases from 2 to 4 to 6. So I might say that there's an effect of motivation level going on here. And in fact, I have an effect that I can call this. This is what is called a main effect of motivation level. The question that I'm asking, of course, is are there differences in these marginal means? And you can see that, yes, there are. Not only are there differences, they seem to increase in a particular pattern. Now, I can also answer the same question for the variable of difficulty. So let's do that. Let's compute those marginal means. That would look a little bit different. This time, I would go down these columns. I would say, what's the mean of 3, 5, and 10? And what's the mean of 1, 3, and 2? So let's just reveal those. Those means are 6 and 2. So is there a an effect? Is there a, a, a change in performance as a function of difficulty? And the answer is yes. When the task is easy, performance is larger. It's 6 compared to when the task is hard. Now this, of course, if you use the pattern that we've developed, this is also called a main effect. This is a main effect of difficulty. I ask the question, are there differences in these marginal means? And of course, just like before, the answer is yes. It seems like I do have main effects of motivation level and main effects of difficulty. Now there's one thing that we haven't asked yet, and that is what is an interaction? So let's go ahead and define that. An interaction is where you ask, does the pattern that you're seeing in one variable depend on a specific level of the other? So for these data, I think we began to see that in the graph that we looked at just a little bit earlier. In fact, let's go ahead and scroll back up to that. So the question is, does the pattern of performance in one variable, let's just say motivation level, depend on the level of the other one, i.e. difficulty? And the answer is, yes, of course it does. For easy tasks, the pattern is as motivation level increases, so does performance, right? You're getting that increase. But the pattern is different for hard tasks. It does this, it goes up a little bit, and then it sort of debilitates. It's like the, the motivation is too high, and there's sort of a flaming out effect. So because you're seeing something like this for one level, but something like this in the other, and they're not parallel with each other, that is a signature of what we call an interaction. The effect differs depending on the level of the other variable. So that's how we structure questions, or that's how we structure research questions in these kinds of designs. We ask, are there main effects? And we ask, are there interactions? And the main effects are where we test the marginal means, and the interaction is whether is where we test, essentially, it's the residuals of what you would get from adding the marginal means uh, effects to the grand mean. What's left over that needs to be done to adjust to change to these? But I think the conceptual definition of interaction is a little bit easier here. Okay, so that's what main effects and interactions are. How do you compute them? How do you say, yes, there is a real effect going on here? Remember, just, just the numbers themselves, yes, there are differences. But we have to test, are these differences beyond what we'd expect from measurement error alone, right? From sampling variability. So we have to do some sort of statistical test to quantify how big these effects are beyond just that noise on the ground. And of course, the answer is we're going to use an analysis of variance. You probably knew that already. How does a factorial ANOVA work? Well, you already know the basics of an ANOVA. That is, we take the total variability in the observed data and we split it into two types. We have the variance between treatments and then what's left over, which is the variance within treatments. Now, for the factorial ANOVA, this variance between treatments comes from three different sources. It comes from variance due to one of the factors, so this might be motivation in this case, variance due to the other factor, which is difficulty, and then finally variance that's due to that interaction between them. So you have these three different sources of between treatment variability. These sources then we convert to uh, we compute these variances and then we compare those variances to this and that's how we get our f ratios so you already know everything it is that you need to do these 
they're very similar. The computations of, of these uh, variances and the F ratios are very similar to the other ANOVAs, but they're just tedious. Uh, we could spend a good 20 minutes here doing an example, but I think instead we're just going to use JASP. So you know the basics of doing ANOVA. Now let's let the technology really uh, shine here. So to use JASP, the one thing that you have to do is you have to feed it a data file. So we're going to take our original uh, data set, which if we scroll all the way back up here was right here at the beginning. We're gonna convert that into a CSV file and we need to do it in a specific way. So let's outline what that way is first and then we'll do it. So this data file, as I mentioned, it's a spreadsheet that's saved as a CSV uh, that's just the format. A CSV is comma separated value. So it's a simple text-based spreadsheet format. Now, the way it needs to be structured is this. You have to have one column for your dependent variable. These are the measurements, right? So we're going to have one column for those performance scores. And then you need to have one column for each of your independent variables. So I'm going to have a column for, for motivation, and I'm going to have a column for difficulty. And on each row, then, I'm going to have each observation. So I'm going to have a measurement and then which combination of uh, motivation level and difficulty produced that observation. So that's enough talking. Let's actually just do it. So I'm going to scroll back up to uh, the original data. And we're going to adjust the screen just a little bit here. Let me pop up uh, Excel. You can use OpenOffice, Excel, whatever you want. Just a spreadsheet program that can save as a CSV. So let's pop up Excel. I have that open. I'm going to put it over on this side of the screen. And then this little window I'm going to put on that side of the screen. Okay, so let's look at these data. Uh, what I'm going to do first, I always like to put my independent variables first. So I'm going to put difficulty first. Oops, let's just say difficulty. And I'm going to uh, zoom in just a little bit on this if I can. Uh, zoom just so it's a little bit bigger on the screen for you on the video. This should be better. Okay, so there's, there's a column for difficulty. I'll have a column for motivation. And then I'll have a column for my dependent variable, which was performance. Okay, so here's how I do it. I take them a cell at a time. So first, consider this cell that's uh, easy difficulty and low motivation. I've got five numbers, three, one, one, six, and four. So each of those goes on its own row, three, one, one, six, and four. And then each of those comes from easy difficulty and low motivation. And instead of typing that each time, I'm going to highlight these two cells. And then over here in the bottom, when that turns into a solid plus sign, if I click and drag, it'll just fill those labels right down through there. This is very important. Save yourself some work. Make sure that you're always typing these labels exactly the same, okay? Uh, otherwise, otherwise, things are going to screw up. Now, let's go to the next one, which is, come on, let's get that up out of the way of this little indicator down here. Uh, one, four, eight, six, and six. One, four, eight, six, and six. Now these each come from easy difficulty and medium motivation. So once again, I'm going to scroll this down like so. And then the last group at the bottom here is 10, 10, 14, 7, and 9. Okay. And then those come from easy difficulty and high motivation and hover until it becomes a solid dark plus, and then scroll down. So we're halfway there. Now let's do the hard one. So 02003, so, so these come from hard difficulty and low motivation. So you see what we're doing is we're basically uh, making all the possible combinations of these two levels of difficulty and these three levels of motivation. Uh, the next group down is 2722 two, two, and 2. These come from hard difficulty and medium motivation. And we'll just fill those down. And then finally, the last one is one, 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 six, and one. Okay, and that comes from hard difficulty and high motivation. And that is our data file, all done. So you'll notice it ends at row 31. The first row was a header, so that means we have 30 rows, which is perfect because we have 30 observations. So we're gonna save this. So I'm gonna hit save. 
Now I want to save it as a CSV file. I'm gonna put it on my desktop. It doesn't matter where you put it. I'm gonna call it just example one. The main thing that you have to do here to make it work with JASP is down here under file format, you have to specify that it's a CSV file. So I'm gonna do that and hit save. Now I'm all done. That's gonna tell you uh, you're gonna lose data. No, you're not because you don't care about anything except for these numbers and this data, okay? So let's get rid of that. Don't need that anymore. Now I'm ready to open it up in JASP. So here is JASP all ready to go for us. Um, let's see, we want to go here and say open, and I'm going to go to computer and browse. And I'm going to go find that file once my dialog pops up. Here it is. It's called example1.csv. And then you'll see exactly those data uh, right here in JASP for us. So what do we do? Well, we go to ANOVA, right? Uh, JASP is so dead simple in how this works. We just click ANOVA. And we're gonna do classical ANOVA first. I know you Bayesians out there want to do a Bayesian ANOVA. That's coming up in a few minutes. We're gonna do classical ANOVA first. So we just click on classical, then ANOVA. And here's what we do. It's, it's really simple. Let me uh, pop this all the way across there for us. What we do is we put our dependent variable into the slot that says dependent variable. So that's performance. And then the other two variables we put into this so-called fixed factors box. And now the ANOVA is going to compute. And there it is. What you may notice here is an ANOVA table. This is exactly what we've been doing in the course so far. There, uh, Here you have your, your sources. These are the three different sources. This is your main effect of difficulty, main effect of motivation. And then this little symbol here is your interaction. And then here's what's left over. These are the residuals. And here's your sum of squares, your DF, your variance or mean square columns, your F ratios. And it goes ahead and computes the p-values for you. So we're going to talk about how to interpret these in a second. Uh, you already know how to interpret them. Basically, it's li like any p-value. If it's small, that means that the data are rare if the null is true. And the null in these cases would be a null effect of difficulty, a null effect of motivation, and third, a null interaction. And we can see that we are going to reject the null in all three cases. So what that means is we have significant main effects of difficulty, motivation, and we have a significant interaction. So we're going to write that out. I'm going to show you how to get all of the stuff out of the table uh, just as a review. But I also want to show you something that JASP will do very nicely for us, and that's to make a very nice plot. Uh, the way we do this is we go over here to where it says descriptives plots, and we click on that. And here we can start putting our variables or our factors in to build a plot. Now you might remember in our plot, I put motivation on the horizontal axis. I'm gonna do that here. I'll just click it over to horizontal axis. And then I wanted separate lines for each level of difficulty. So I do that into the separate lines. And I give it a minute to go through. It's gonna make the plot for me. And you might notice already, oh no, something's broken. This looks different than the plot that we did before. Let me remind you of what the plot that we did before looks like. All right, looks different from that. What's going on? What's going on is JASP tried to infer an ordering of motivation on the uh, bottom axis, and it put high before low before medium, which really doesn't make much sense at all. In fact, it's just doing it by alphabetical order. But I actually want low to be first, and then medium, and then high. So you might be curious, you know, how, how exactly do I do this? Well, let me show you real quickly. What I do, is, and this doesn't happen all the time, so it just uh, it happens in this case. Uh, what I do is I go into the uh, data spreadsheet view of JASP, and I want to change the ordering of the levels of motivation. So I'm going to go up here to the header called motivation, and I'm going to click on it. And up here is going to have my labels. And I could actually change those labels if I wanted to. But one of the things you'll notice is the first one in the list is high, the second is low, the third is medium. That's the order it's putting things in. Well, I want it to be low, medium, high. So that means that I want this high to come down here to the bottom. So the way I'm going to do that, so I'm going to click on it. And then down here, I'm going to use this little down arrow to push it down to the bottom. Now, by doing that, I have now placed my labels in the correct order, increasing low, medium, to high. So I'll just hit X to get out of this. And I'm going to go back to my plot, and it has done a weird thing. So I'm going to undo this, just move this stuff off, 
and then I'm going to rebuild my plot. Okay, it's just a little bug right now that doesn't always reproduce correctly, but all you have to do is just get them out of there and rebuild your plot. So once again, I'll put motivation on the horizontal axis and then difficulty on my separate lines. And in a second, I should see exactly the same plot. Okay, that looks pretty similar, doesn't it? Yeah, looks very, very similar. So cool. That's how you make a descriptive plot in JASP. It's a really nice thing. And plus, when you're making reports in like Word documents or something, you can go here to uh, where you have this little upside down triangle and you can, oops, not there, up here. And, well, it's not what letting me do this. Aha, here we go. Click on that and you can actually save image as something. You can save it as a PNG, a PDF, all kinds of different file formats. So that's a really helpful, really helpful thing. Okay, so that's how you do the ANOVA in JASP. Let's real quickly just review, I'm going to get JASP out of the way for a second, and let's just review how uh, we interpret this, how do we get the information out of the ANOVA table. Well, remember, in a factorial design, we have three questions. Main effects, actually two questions, main effects, of which there are several, and then the interaction, okay? So let's look first at the main effect of difficulty. That's the first one that appears in my list. So I need to report the F ratio. So I'm going to say F of 1 and 24. Remember, I take the degrees of freedom from the, uh, from the ANOVA table. I use the, the degrees of freedom between the levels of difficulty and the residual degrees of freedom. Uh, that F ratio is 24, and the P value is really small, which JASP just truncates to less than 0.001. And what that means, of course, is it's a significant main effect of difficulty. That is, difficulty affects performance. There is a change in performance that stems from difficulty. I can do the exact same thing for motivation. Okay, uh, Main effect of motivation level. This time it's F of 224 because motivation has three levels, right? So the degrees of freedom between those levels is 2. And that F ratio was 8, and the p-value is still small. It's uh, less than a two-tenths of a percent. And that, of course, is also a significant uh, effect of motivation level on performance. And then finally, the interaction, right, is the, uh, is, is, or is the pattern in one variable dependent on which level of the other that you're on? And the answer is yes. Again, we reject the null here, and we would report that this way. That interaction we would report as f of 224 equals 6 uh, with a p-value of 0 0.008. And that being significant means that the effect of motivation, right, that increasing effect, depends on the difficulty, right? And uh, again, we saw that very clearly from our graph earlier. Let me pull JASP back up here real quick. We saw that very clearly. The effect of motivation increases for easy tasks, but kind of goes up and peters out for hard tasks. So that is a classic, classic interaction. All right, so we could stop there. But as we've been doing this semester, we also consider the Bayesian version of these things. So how does all that work here? So the Bayesian ANOVA is really easy to do in JASP. In fact, that's what JASP was built for, were these Bayesian computations. But the technical difficulties are a little different here. What JASP does is it builds five models that are all equally likely a priori and then computes their posterior probability. So after seeing the data, what's the probability that this is the correct model versus the other, the other four models? So I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, doing it in JASP is, is super simple. Uh, you already basically know how to do this. All we've got to do is go up to ANOVA. And then instead of choosing the classical ANOVA, I'm going to choose the Bayesian ANOVA. Now, what do I do? Well, the dialogue is, is the same. I go performance for my dependent variable, and then I put my two factors into the fixed factors box. And then that's all I'm going to check. And what you're going to see down here at the bottom is a little table. Now, for the beginner, this is a difficult table to look at because it no longer looks like an ANOVA table. So that's what I want to focus on now. So what I did was I captured a screenshot of this table from earlier, which might be just uh, a little bit different. Yeah, it is just a little bit different, and I'll explain why in just a second. But let's go to that screenshot. Okay. So as I mentioned, JASP builds five models. What are those models? Well, they are the null model, right? The, that there's no effect of anything. They have a model that has only a main effect of motivation, but nothing else. So that's denoted just motivation. 
There's a model that has only a main effect of difficulty and nothing else. There's a model which has both main effects. Okay, so that's a different model than either of the other two. And then finally, there's a model that uh, has not only the two main effects, but also the interaction between them. So knowing what we know about the frequentist thing, right? We found that there was a main effect of difficulty, a main effect of motivation, and also an interaction. So we would expect that this model, which contains all three of those as predictors, would be the best model. And in fact, that's what JASP is telling us. When you see that model listed up here at the top, whichever model's at the top is the one that fits the data the best. Uh, how do we know that? Well, that's because the posterior probability, right, this probability of the model after seeing the data, notice it's about 82%. That's the highest posterior probability compared to any of these other models. So that's how a, a Bayesian ANOVA works. It's Bayesian model comparison. We put all five of these potential models in, and then we essentially let them battle it out with the data and see which one wins. Now, we could stop there, but I like to to think about Bayesian analysis of variance in a way that mirrors what we do in the frequentist sense. And that is, how can we talk about the idea of a main effect and the idea of an interaction? So how do we compute Bayes factors for these main effects and interactions? And the answer is we use something that's called an inclusion Bayes factor. And the rest of this lecture is going to be spent talking about how you get that from these data. Now you can see much more detail in one of our recent papers that was published in the Journal of Numerical Cognition. I'll put a link in the video and where I go through and explain uh, much better what uh, an inclusion base factor is. But in short, I think we can do a decent job of it here in the video. So what is an inclusion base factor? Well, simply put, remember a base factor quantifies how much your belief in something has been updated, right? So for this sense, an inclusion base factor for an effect is the factor by which your prior odds for including the effect in a model are updated after observing the data. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Uh, it's, it's really, once you get it, this is a very simple statement to understand, but I will tell you this is not easy to get at first. So this is why I want to walk through computing one of these inclusion base factors and interpreting it before I show you how to do it in JASP. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the way it works is this. First, we compute the prior odds for including the effect. Okay, so we have five models that we, we set to be all equally likely a priori. So that means they each have a, pr a prior probability of 20%, right? 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.2, and 0.2. So we compute the prior odds for including the effect in one of those models. Then we compute the posterior odds for including the effect. Remember, after seeing the data, those prior odds, 0 0.2, or those prior probabilities, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, et cetera, they get shifted around. And then one of those models really gets a high posterior and the rest gets smaller ones. So we're gonna look at all the models that include that effect, and then we're gonna compute the posterior odds. Then to get the base factor, well, you simply divide the posterior by the prior. That's what a base factor is. So we divide the posterior odds by the prior odds. So let's talk about how to do that with these data. So I've copied down that um, table, just the part that, that we really need to pay attention to, which are the um, prior probabilities here and the posterior probabilities. The rest of it doesn't matter for this. So how do we get um, how do we uh, how do we get these inclusion base factors? Well, we're going to focus on the main effect of difficulty, right? We're going to do one for difficulty, one for motivation, and one for the interaction. So let's do difficulty first. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to note which of these models contains difficulty, right? Contains a main effect of difficulty. Well, it's going to be this model here, this model, and this model. The other two, the one that has motivation only and the one that's the null model, they, of course, don't contain the effect of difficulty. So I'm going to leave those out. Now, the prior probability of those of, of containing difficulty then is those three guys right there, right? 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.2. And the posterior probability of including difficulty is those three guys added together. So what do we do with all those numbers? Well, let's walk through it. First thing that we do from the list, we compute the prior odds for including difficulty. So 
Odds is a ratio of probabilities, and specifically, it's the probability of including difficulty in the model, which is these guys, divided by the probability of not including difficulty, which is these two down here. So in numbers, that would be these three highlighted point twos in the numerator, divided by these two that are not highlighted. Okay. So point two plus two, point two plus point two on top, two of them on the bottom, that gives me a ratio of 0.6 divided by 0.4, which is a prior odds of 1.50. 1.5 to 1 of including difficulty in the model. Okay, so that's the prior odds. So we put that aside. The next part is we compute the posterior odds for including difficulty in the model. Now remember, uh, odds is a ratio of probabilities. So I consider the, the posterior probabilities uh, that have difficulty in the model. That's these three up top. So I've put them in the numerator. Okay, 0.817 plus 0.154 plus 0.026. And then in the bottom, I put these two that don't include it. 0 0.002 and 0 0.001. Now I can't do those in my head, so let's pop them into a calculator. It turns out we get a numerator of 0.997 and a denominator of 0 0.003. And we find that quotient, that quotient is 332.33. So that means after seeing data, uh, the odds for including difficulty in the model are pretty high, 332.33 to one. The base factor is the amount by which those odds have changed. So I simply divide them. It's the posterior odds here divided by the prior odds, and that gives us uh, a quotient of 221.55. That's the inclusion Bayes factor. So essentially, this is the Bayes factor for your main effect of difficulty, and here's how I would interpret it. The interpretation is the observed data are 221.55 times more likely under a model which contains a main effect of task difficulty. So this is essentially your replacement then for the frequentist p-value in a way that you can kind of ask the same questions, are there main effects, um, of specific things, or are there is there an interaction? But you can do it in a Bayes factor sense, so you can make statements like this, which I think are really nice. Now, I will note that JASP will produce these for you. All you have to do is check effects under tables. Let me show you that real quickly. So you don't have to do these by hand necessarily. Although, uh, you know, in a, in a classroom sense, I will ask you to do some of this by hand just so you get an idea of how it works. Yeah, look under here under tables. You just click on effects and these inclusion base factors will pop up. You'll notice this inclusion base factor is a 225. We got 221. That's round off error. Okay, that's all it is. Uh, notice the inclusion base factors are pretty big for all three. That means that the data are these many times more likely uh, under models which contain the relevant effect than do not. So there you go. All right, so that is pretty much it for the day. Let's just take a quick moment for a summary. So for factorial ANOVA, uh, we ask questions about main effects and interactions. Uh, to do a factorial ANOVA, you have to have at least two main effects. It doesn't make sense to only have one. It's not factorial then. Uh, and there's always at least one interaction. If you have multiple independent variables beyond two, you're going to have several levels of interactions. We're not going to talk about those for right now, but uh, it's certainly something that can happen. And then how do you test these effects? Well, of course, you can do it either frequentist or Bayesian, or you can do both. Uh, the frequentist test, you use the p-value to reject the null. Of course, the downside of that is you can't accept the null. Uh, so if you want to get evidence for including or not including, you really need to use a Bayesian test. And in that case, we use inclusion base factors. So that's it for today. A little taste of factorial designs, not only from the frequentist sense, but also the Bayesian sense. And I will look forward to seeing you on the next lecture.